Hi, welcome to the 24th Rule of Acquisition. The 24th Rule of Acquisition is the arbitrary constant tell, which basically means that an arbitrary constants are the placeholders for missing pieces of the puzzle. This presentation demonstrates that arbitrary constants, also known as constants of relation, obscure the underlying mechanisms of nature by this little picture here. And in this video, we're going to show how resolving arbitrary constants into non-arbitrary constructs reveal the underlying mechanisms. Now, why is this important? Well, the legacy scientific method of proposing a theory and verifying it experimentally is insufficient. And let me give you an example why. This example comes from the Foundation Series, which you can find at distinti.com. Look for the thing Foundation Series. In that video set, there is the quad loop experiment. In the quad loop experiment, we take loop of wire, which has the radius of the loop is A and the diameter of the wire, or the radius of the wire is B. And we want to compute the inductance of this loop. Well, in classical electrodynamics by Jackson, they have an equation. I had to correct it because I had an extra thing in there that's not uh, valid. And so I had to remove that invalid thing. And so when you fix that, they come up with mu A times the natural log of 8A divided by B minus 2. And that's the answer they get. Okay, and this is using the classical B field from classical theory, which is a donut-shaped field around an accelerating charge, or a moving charge. Okay, then also, you have in Maxwell's original derivation, he has the mutual inductance between two loops of wire, where the loops of wire have the radius A and the loops of wire are separated by distance B. This would be the mutual conducting case. But this is not the same as this. However, it gets exactly the same answer. Exactly the same answer. And then in the foundation series, I went searching for more models of magnetism that could solve this. And I found a longitudinal field model and a spherical field model given by these geometry indicators. This is the indexing that the software used to go search. That's what those numbers mean. And then when you, you apply them to this thing, you get exactly the same answers. All of these give exactly the same answers. Now, there's going to be some physicists out there, I'm sure, that says, well, if they're all given the same answer, they must be based on the same physics. No, the fields are all different, and this is complete fairy tale. The reason why these all give the same answer is due to what's called, what I call, constraints. If you want to learn more about this, go see the Foundation series. But the point of the matter is, is that now we have four different field models, or four different applications that give the same exact answer. Now this one we know is not the answer because it's fairy tale. It's for dual loops of wire. Okay, and this one we can't use because uh, then the way we disambiguate the rest is simple. We look at a dipole antenna. And a dipole antenna has inductance. We know this because dipole antennas resonate. Okay, but you cannot apply uh, Jackson, because Jackson is based on vector magnetic potentials, and the rules of vector magnetic potentials is that vector magnetic potentials mean nothing unless they're applied to a closed loop. That's in all your textbooks. Go, go look it up if you don't believe me. So, and it's not internal inductance or intrinsic inductance, whatever you want to call it, because that's what I had to remove from Jackson to get Jackson the right answer. The internal inductance is a bogus derivation. You can find it. I'd redo the derivation in the foundation series and show you that's a completely bogus derivation. So this model, this B model, B field model, is not the correct model. Both of these models give exactly the same answer for a dipole inductance. Okay, and the way we disambiguated these is saying, well, okay, if I want to couple from a dipole to a dipole, well, this guy has no energy off the broadside where this guy does, so it cannot be this model. So this is the model that I chose as the proper model of induction and therefore magnetism. Okay, result 5008, and when you break it down into a charge, point charge equation, it looks just like this. Okay, and then now we're going to use this model to explore the arbitrary constant tell in a moment. First, 
Okay, let's go off on a little tangent and just get some definitions about what arbitrary constants are. There are different types of constants, like you have conversion constants. For example, you can convert inches to meters or watts to horsepower. Those are okay. Those are just conversion constants. They're not arbitrary. And then you have directly measurable constants like the speed of light. Directly measurable, I'm using this term, is that all you need is something that measures length and something that measures time. And with those two pieces of equipment, you can directly measure the speed of light. Pi is the same thing. You just take the circumference divided by the diameter. Now somebody's going to say, well, pi can't be expressed perfectly in, in the real universe. Yeah, well, I mean, we can express it to a certain precision. That's fine. Same thing with the speed of light. We only have a certain number of precision of accuracy of the speed of light because our tools are limited. So there's no worry about that. Okay, then you have the arbitrary constants, and also known as constants of relation. Okay, arbitrary constants contain arbitrary units that may not actually make any sense, and they cannot be directly measured. Okay, and they're usually used to relate measured values to one another. In other words, let me give you an example with Coulomb's model. Well, let me give you an example with Coulomb's model. In Coulomb's model, we take one charge and then another charge. We measure the distance between them and we measure the charge that's on each sphere and then we measure the force acting on one or both. Okay, so the force is some function of two charges divided by a distance d. Turns out it's inverse squared, but we need some kind of constant here that makes these things on the right fall into and create something called force. That's called a constant of relation. It relates these units, which have nothing to do with this unit, to this unit. Okay, and this is a completely arbitrary constant. And what I'm going to show you is we're going to dissolve all the constants of classical electrodynamics. And we're going to break them down into what they really mean. It's going to blow your mind wide open. Okay, these are all examples of arbitrary constants. This is G for that used in the gravity model and in general relativity. It's used for both. It's arbitrary. This is mu naught, which is what they call the permeability of free space thing. And it goes by these units. But ever, you know, but physicists don't like this because this doesn't mean anything. So they try to obscure it by saying, well, it's Henry's per meter, which works out to newtons per ampere square or newtons per square ampere. And that, that makes sense because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared and an ampere squared is a coulomb squared per second squared and so the seconds cancel and you end up with kilogram meters per coulomb squared okay so they like putting it in this term because it feels more like a circuit okay i don't do that if you put it in this i'm going to show you and when you write it in the most simplest form that's actually what it means and we're going to show you that now what i like to do I don't like to have it in this form. I like to put it in this form and keep it in the form of Km, which is mu over 4 pi, because it's easier to remember 1 times 10 to the minus 7 rather than 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. And this is basically the way we use it in most of the equations anyway. So I just like to write it like this. A lot of people do this. I'm not the only one who does that. Okay, and then you have the electrical constant, which is this, with this quagmire of units over here. Okay, but again, the way it's used in units is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And I like to write it like that because all you have to remember is 9 times 10 to the 9th. It's very easy to remember. And it's like this. And it's just nice because it matches this guy. We have kilograms in the numerator and coulomb squared in the denominator. And really the only difference between them is, is uh, speed squared, which turns out to be the speed of light squared. Okay, so this is a much easier way to remember. And if you want more precision than that, which you really don't need in most cases, it's 8.9875526, blah, blah, this guy down here. So this is the more precise version of that. So let's get started with Km, which is the magnetic field constant. Okay, now let's bring new induction. We're writing new induction right here. And we're going to write the inertial force model here. Now the inertial force model is the negative of Newton's model here. The reason why is when you apply force to an object, the inertial force that's opposing you is the mass times the opposite of the direction of acceleration. So that 
is the force that's that's pushing back on your finger when you try to push it. Okay, and this is the way we use it for most second order system declarations in engineering anyway. So this is nothing new. This is just maybe unfamiliar to some people. So this is your inertial force, not your applied force. This is the force of inertia acting on your applied force. And if you look at your inertial force and you look at new induction, what do you see? Holy cockamole, Batman. These have the same units. This little block of characters has the units of kilograms of all things. Okay, so couldn't see that with classical theory, only with new induction. And again, it's the only one that reconciles all the experiments where Faraday's law only works for, for closed loops. That's the key. Faraday doesn't mean Faraday's law is wrong. It just means it's limited to closed loops. And if you go through the foundation series, I show that Faraday's law also violates the 17th rule of acquisition, which is the ambiguity tell. But you go there and you'll see it. So there's a, Faraday's law violates a lot of other laws of acquisition, rules of acquisition. So let's consider. The only problem we have here is this force here. This acceleration is the acceleration of one charge. Okay, so what this says is if I have a charge accelerating over here, call that the source, and I have another target charge over here, that as this guy accelerates, he's going to commit a fork, make a force that's going to hit this other guy that's called the target charge, and he's going to have a force in the opposite direction of his acceleration. Okay, so can we make a model like that, which shows us inertia? Yes, we can. If we just take a pair of charges, well, can you take these pair of charges, and they're a very small distance apart, and you put them on top of your finger, yeah, that's a big finger, and they both fit on the top of your finger, and you try to push those two charges together. Now what I'm gonna do, so it doesn't take up so much space, I'm just showing them separated like this, but they both are being pushed together. Okay, well then the force on number one is the acceleration of number two, divided by the distance between them, and that'll be this force here. The force on number two is the acceleration of one divided by the distance, yada, yada, yada. So that's the force on number two. The total force acting on your fingertip is the sum of the two. And so this says here now that from this system of two charges, and what we call these in ethereal mechanics, this is a second order system, but we're not gonna get much detail right now. And so the effective inertia of these two is this. That's the effective inertia. Okay? That's the effective inertia. Now watch what happens. Okay, let's substitute for the distance d equals twice 2re, twice the classical electron radius. So we're going to substitute 2RE into here for D, and the 2's drop out, and you have KM, Q1, Q2 over little R, little E. Now set in the following distance. Set RE to the classical electron radius. Set Q1 and Q2 to the charge of an electron, which is this. Okay, and then when you crank through the numbers, what do you get? You get the mass of an electron to one more degree of precision than is published on the internet, at least at the time I looked at this. I haven't looked at it recently. I did, I did all this number. This is in the foundation series. Okay, so this shows right here, right now, that inertia can be replaced with electromagnetic induction. And in the foundation series, I show you how gravity can also be replaced by electromagnetic induction. But you can go there on your own. So what does all this have to do with arbitrary constants? Well, let's go back to this electroinertia equation, or this one here, for the, for the mass of an electron, okay? And that worked out, the, the, the mass part of it, the part that is the effective inertia in kilograms, is Km Q1 Q2 over little re, or r little e. And so if we break down the units of just Km, Km is K kilograms meters per coulomb squared. And the part of the system that this is used against is coulomb squared over meters. And we'll write that down here. And so if you look real close, some of you physicists out there might not see this, but I'm sure you engineers will see it, is that Km looks like it's just a conversion constant 
between a natural units of inertia to the arbitrary units of inertia. In other words, Km converts electrical inertia to this arbitrary thing we call kilograms. So what we're going to do, just to show you again, is we're going to define natural inertia as square coulombs per meter. And it's cool about this, this actually represents the system. It's two charges separated by a distance. So it's not like it's arbitrary. It actually represents a real system. It's not arbitrary. Okay, and so this B, when we call, you use the term Burls for B, the reason why we did this is because we're getting rid of the B field from classical theory, and we want to reuse the, word, the term B. So this is your inertial field, your inertia in Burls. And Burls is short for Burley. Okay, that's just what, we, what he chose. It's not the best thing, but that's what we're stuck with. Okay, so now if we replace these values with this, so then you see the proper conversion factor. That Km is kilograms per burl times burl equals kilogram. It's just a conversion constant. It's no longer arbitrary. It means something. This Km is no longer arbitrary. All it is is a conversion constant. And because we've re dissolved the, the constant and it makes sense with the underlying system that we described, this is profound. I've been expressing this almost for 20 years now, but we're going to go a little bit further tonight than I've gone from before. Okay, and I just said that, so I don't have to say that again. You can stop that to read that if you wish. But wait, there's more. This means that mass, which is really inertia, is an electromagnetic phenomenon. It's not an intrinsic property of matter. This means that the mass of an electron is a synthesis of at least two inertialess charges. The name given to these inertialess charges in all of our other work is called protons, which means a precursor to leptons. In other words, leptons are made of protons. Protons always move at the speed of light and seem to form stable systems when orbiting each other. All the other fields cancel. You can see the derivations found in these episodes of the Foundation series. And these systems of protons are called second-order systems of protons. In the old papers, the second-order system of protons were called binary mass particles, and protons were called massless particles, which is an oxymoron, because massless means you have no quantity. A mass is a an expression of quantity. It's never supposed to have been an expression of inertia, but somehow inertia and quantity got confused together only because it was very highly related. Now we're showing you we can't do this. Um, and so we are disambiguating now. You know, just like in the past, they had to dis disambiguate weight from mass. Well, because of Einstein's principle equivalence where weight and inertia are equivalent, Okay, well then it makes sense that it's equivalent that we have to disambiguate inertia from mass as well. So if we have to disambiguate one and they're equivalent, we have to disambiguate the other. And that's what we've done in ethereal mechanics. And we were the first people to do that. You won't hear this anywhere else. Okay, mass is not, or inertia is not an intrinsic property of matter. It's an electromagnetic phenomenon, and so is gravity. And the paper... Uh, electrogravity is underway. I'm hoping the initial Patreon-only release will be by December. Could be a little bit longer. There's a lot of work to be done. Lots of simulations, a lot of animations. Okay, but a very clever person might ask right now, and I'm hoping there's lots of clever people out there. It's like, well, wait a minute. You put two coulombs in this, in this example. You have two coulombs in there. So that means that the electric field of this system is twice the electric field of an electron. So how, what's going on here? Ah, well, that's one of the recent breakthroughs, my friend. Okay, we will address this question after. The first thing we're going to do is look at the Coulomb field next. And once we understand the Coulomb field, then we'll go back and reconcile that issue of the two. Okay, so what we did in the homework for EMF003, and the, the result, the, the solution to the homework from EMF003 is found in EMF005. Okay, I said if you have this system, and the two charges are separated by a little RP, and you have this other test charge at a very, 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 very long distance away, there's a little D up there you can't see. Okay, then I say plug in new induction 
to find out what the inductive effect of this rotating system is. Uh, now, now, we're just doing it when the charges are right boresight to the target charge. Okay, when you do all this derivation and plug it all in, okay, and keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going, the answer is this, aha. So, we can use new induction, okay, to get an answer that looks just like an electric field. But again, just like what you guys were going to say, it looks like twice the electric field. And the answer to that was a recent epiphany. Okay, and the recent epiphany is that you have to cons consider that this system is spinning, okay? And only when the, when the charges are boresight do you have that maximum value of twice the electric field. When these charges are orthogonal, the answer is zero. So what you have to do is we'll go back to this part of the derivation, okay, and then write the force as a function of theta, Okay, which means wherever you have a RP, you have to place that with cosine theta RP. Okay, but not over here, only in this area here. And then, because the force vector is only along the direction perpendicular, or I guess this way, this means that the force vector is also the cosine of theta that's applied to that. So you have to put another cosine of theta on the outside. Okay, and so once you reduce all this, you get to this equation. Oh, then what you have to do is take the average force and integrate from 0 to theta equals pi over 2. And making it an average, you divide by pi over 2. Okay, so once you evaluate this average, bada bing, bada boom. And I had to do it numerically because I could not figure out how to do that. If somebody knows how to resolve this integral manually, I'd be very appreciative if you show me how. I did this on a computer and resolved it numerically. It was pretty simple to do. The answer comes out exactly the same as Coulomb's model. So Coulomb's law, which is bullshit, it's not a law, okay? It's really a byproduct of a spherical magnetic field and the behavior of a second order system of pretons, okay? And you will not find this anywhere else in the world, only here. Not in quantum mechanics, not in general relativity, not in Ken Wheeler's site, not in the electric universe. I am the first one that derived the new induction model 20 years ago. It's on file at the patent office. Um, and it's, and it's, I have lots of documentation. And it's also been, um, what do you call it? Uh, well, lots of other places. Uh, copyrighted, too. Okay, and now, first ever... The derivation of the electric field as a magnetic field phenomenon. And this also means that the charges, the relationship of the preton charge to the electric charge are not one and the same. In this case, two pretonic charges okay, result in the result of one Coulomb charge. Okay, because the system is, is active, it's dynamic. Okay, because it is that, the average force over time works out to one, uh, the, the, the charge of one charge. Okay, and the other thing, there was something else I had to mention here, and I forgot what it was. Uh, if I remember it, I'll say it. There was some other, another important point. Oh, well. Okay, so again, there's no such thing as an electric charge. What we've been calling an electric charge is synthesized from magnetic charges. Okay, and don't get magnetic charges confused with magnetic monopoles. Magnetic monopoles are complete gibberish. These are magnetic charges. So in order to avoid the confusion, we're going to call these magnetic charges pretonic charge. Okay, now right now it's two pretonic charges per electric charge. And this may change as because there's other ways to normalize these systems, especially when we start spinning in 3D. So the quantity of pretonic charges to electric charges may change as we learn more of how these systems spin in 3 Right now, this is a simplified solution. It works. It gets the right answer. And, it, and because we're able to dissolve away the arbitrary constants, this shows an underlying system that's there that creates the electric field from a spinning system of pretonic charges.
Okay, again, nobody else is going to show you this. But the important part of this video is that KE is no longer arbitrary. Just like KM is no longer arbitrary. KE can now be replaced with a conversion constant and a measured variable. And it just shows you that when you understand the underlying system, the equations will reflect that system without the need for arbitrary constants. Okay, there are no need anymore. In the past, I wasn't quite sure about this, but as the more things and epiphanies have come forward, I'm absolutely positive that there's no need for arbitrary constants, and you, you will not have a theory of everything that has one damn arbitrary charge in it. Okay, so we're making, next thing is to take out G. Now I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that. We're not gonna do G tonight. We're probably not going to do G, at least not now. But now that I've basically destroyed these arbitrary constants of classical electromagnetic theory, okay, the SS classical dynamics is now sunk, taking on water. It's got no life left in it. Here is the book from the foundation series where everything that I found wrong, I tore the pages out. Okay, now let's go back through. We got more to do, and there goes my microphone. Okay, oh, the microphone still works. Poor Amanda and Olivia. So Coulomb's law, it's not a law, it's a model, and the electric field intensity. It's not an electric field, it's a magnetic field. Chapter two now goes bye-bye. Not that we can't still use it, but the thing is, the more important thing about this, that's the thing I was trying to remember, is it's no longer an inverse square. Because it's derived from a second order system of pretons, as you get closer to that spinning second order, the electric field starts to not follow this relationship anymore. Okay, I'm the first one to tell you that and the first one to show you that. Of course, there's going to be a lot of people plagiarizing me after this. It doesn't matter. I've got everything written right. So now, chapter two is gone. Chapter three, electric flux density and Gauss's law and divergence. Gauss's law is still useful, divergence still, but it's not electric flux anymore. And again, these things do not, are not valid as you get closer to the second order system of pretons. Okay, and energy, chapter four is energy and potential. Well, if you look at, I believe it's one of my other videos, I show that the energy models in electromagnetic physics are ambiguous. In electromagnetic physics here in this book, they treat energy ubiquitously. They do not consider potential energy or kinetic energy. Maxwell's original equations do, and I reinvented that, and when I did my research for my thesis, I found Maxwell already had it, so I had to give him credit for it, but it makes sense. We need to start disambiguating energy. When Heaviside translated things from Maxwell, he just ambiguated energy, and it's led to all kinds of problems. So energy has got to go. It's got to be redone. Okay, current and conductors, chapter five, that can stay. That's just Ohm's model. That's valid, it's just circuit theory, no big deal. So chapter one is just a review of vector equations. That's okay, vectors are fun. Well, actually not because uh, the problem with vectors, okay, the problem with vectors is there's no vector divide. And if you go on my website, I had to replace vector analysis to go further. I have to provide a vectors that you can divide, subtract, I mean, multiply and divide. You can't, multi, you don't have a true multiply and you certainly don't have a divide. So vector analysis is now obsolete too. Okay, circuit theory can stay. I forgot which chapter that was. That was chapter five. Okay, chapter six, dielectrics and capacitance. Ah, these are okay. Dielectrics are really kind of handled with complex numbers, even though they throw a lot of this Maxwell's equation in there. It really, these boundary equation things, we could probably get rid of them. Um, they're fine for now. Poisson and Laplace's equation, no problem there, except that they're applying them to these obsolete field theories. And that's really what this is. This isn't Poisson and Laplace. This is these things applied to potentials. So these are obsolete. And that, I believe, is the last chapter. Chapter seven goes away. So anything left? 
is chapter 6, chapter 5, and chapter 11. Transmission lines is just application of complex math. It's no biggie. Uh, and then, you, of course, you have everything else after chapter 11 is gone, which is basically magnetism. And then after that, it's just the appendixes with the vector identities and units and stuff. So that's the final. That's it. I own electromagnetic theory now. I am the world leader in electromagnetic physics. So, classical electrodynamics, quantum mechanics. I have video, T8 shows particle wave is stupid. It's ridiculous. It's uh, physicists not knowing what the hell they're doing. And quantum entanglement is a complete fraud. And T12 shows that quantum computers are a lie. They're a fraud. Basically what these idiots have done, and Google just announced that they had quantum equivalence or quantum supremacy or whatever the, the term is, yeah, you know what, folks? All of these people are making big bucks off the, off the government because the government wants a tool that can crack any encryption. And that is the cocaine that they're putting up the nose of the government to get lots of funding. They, they, yeah, they may produce a box, but I guarantee you it's going to be a classical computer that's just packaged in a box that says quantum mechanics on it. Quantum mechanics. And what happened was quantum mechanics started off really cool. They did some really good things, good things that we use still in engineering today. And all the stuff over here um, is actually where quantum mechanics got its name from. It makes perfect sense. You know, where molecules attain very discrete and deterministic states of energy. But then they took a right turn into the twilight zone. I think somewhere around Schrodinger's cat. Okay, where you have quantum entanglement, all this, this, this baloney, just total garbage. And, I, you know, it's almost like they buried Schrodinger's cat in a pet cemetery. I don't know, but they went off the rails. And that's going to be the last video, the last torpedo into the side of quantum mechanics. Okay, is the, thing, the next video on quantum mechanics, the last video is going to be called the quantum contradiction. Where I'm going to show that where quantum mechanics is today has nothing to do with its foundation or even its name. Now some of my Patreon folks are like, why do you waste time on quantum mechanics? Why don't you just go further with ethereal mechanics? That's a good question. And it's very important to understand this. Because a lot of these things over here, ethereal mechanics, I couldn't explain. And I was like, I can't explain these things. So either I need to abandon or change ethereal mechanics if these things were valid. And doing the research, I found these things were completely garbage, complete gibberish, actually complete lies. Okay, so they're no longer a threat to ethereal mechanics. And these stuff over here, we can salvage, no problem. That's not a threat for ethereal mechanics. This stuff is quite sane. Okay, so it was very important to clear these experiments out of the air because if these were real experiments and these could really be validated, that would be a threat to ethereal mechanics. But they're not. They're gibberish. And the next torpedo that is going to basically put them down. Okay, now here's the uh, SS general relativity. Okay, you can see here I've got the crosshairs on the arbitrary constant G. But my friends, I am not going to launch any torpedoes. I don't have to. And the reason why I don't have to is because there's nothing in general relativity that threatens ethereal mechanics. Ethereal mechanics is going to explain everything that general relativity can't. And general relativity has a big iceberg it's heading to. That's why I used the Titanic picture. And that big iceberg is that general relativity does not have a model for matter. If you don't have a model for matter, you don't matter. So I don't have to do anything. It's going to run aground on that iceberg. So all these other torpedoes up here that I could have fired at it, it's a waste of my time. I'm going to let the iceberg take care of relativity itself. So let me wrap up. Rule of acquisition 24. The arbitrary constant tell. 24.0. Arbitrary constants are placeholders for missing pieces of the puzzle. In other words, if you know how it works, then nothing should be arbitrary. Arbitrary models, and those are models that have arbitrary constants or rules, can only mimic natural phenomena. They cannot explain it. However, they are authorized for temporary use, mostly by engineers, until the physicists develop valid underlying models. Okay, so really only in the field of engineering should empirical models that use arbitrary constants be used. Because sometimes you just don't really need to know the underlying physics in engineering. You just need to get some measurements together to make a quick model to get past a certain impasse. Okay, and that works. That's valid. We, engineers do it all the time. Okay, but 
Lacking an arbitrary constant is not sufficient by itself to declare a model the final theory. Okay, see rule of acquisition 32, the final theory tell, which will be produced in a couple of weeks. Okay, in 24.4, the arbitrary constants typically come from regression of empirical data. That's you, you engineers. Or you, you physicists who think that you're developing laws when you have laws with arbitrary constants in it. That's an oxymoron. Now, what I've done is I've taken line 32.1 from the final theory tell. And just to show you, the final theory tell says the final theory of everything will be devoid of arbitrary constants. And this reflects back to the rule of acquisition 24. Okay, for my Patreon folks, thank you for being patient. I've been kind of offline a bit trying to get stuff done before winter. And for everyone else out there, we need your support. Okay, I'm trying to do a full-time job and do this. I need more help as far as just if we can get enough funding together with the Patreon that I can do this full-time. I mean, I'm going to do it the best I can, the fastest I can, but any, any effort helps. Okay, and, and if, you're not inter if, you're, if you don't think that this is valid, well, go look at my video T1. I'll put the links in the low bar. It shows that unless we break the light barrier by a factor of 500, we're pretty much an extinct species. Anything that they're going to do with Agenda 21 or all this other nonsense is just going to delay the inevitable. And I go over all that in that video. Okay. And again, T3 says if we don't break the light barrier and we're required to go to a sustainable earth, well, that sustainability of the earth after the oil runs out requires a 90% population cull from its current standards, current levels. So if you want to support Ethereum Mechanics, go to our Patreon site, which is ethereummechanics.com. Uh, we have a lot of different levels of support, all the way from just you want to throw a couple of dollars a month to help support the project, all the way, and then they start at $10 a month where you get access to every scientific video that's made. Uh, and then it goes up to first class passengers. Uh, for $20 a month, you get all the PDFs before they come out and you get access to uh, executables and Excel spreadsheets that do little computations and stuff to show kind of to see how we're going and how the computations work out. $30 uh, gets you into the engineer level where you actually get source code for C Sharp and all the stuff we're working on when it comes available. And you also get review rights to the papers and, and sections when it comes out. So in other words, you can see the sections of the ETH, uh, electrogravity paper as it comes out. Of course, you're not allowed to release to anybody else until it's published for everybody, but at least you can review. And then there's the, the uh, $50 and above is the bridge officers, which help we allowed to make decisions. And you get my personal phone number or my personal email uh, to contact me with after you've been on for five months. Okay, then we have the Ethereum Mechanics blog. Okay, if you want to go check out, um, there's a lot of people that are talking, discussing this stuff. Uh, then there's the main site, distinti.com, where if you want to go see the foundation series, there's an entire page where it links to the YouTube videos. It's actually easier to go to all my YouTube videos from my distinti.com. I link them there. They're all organized better instead of the, you know, silly way YouTube organizes them. Uh, I don't have it fully complete yet. Please come back. I'm going to be hopefully adding more and more to it and hopefully get it mostly complete by before the end of this year. Thank you. And if you also want to just hit the donate button and just give me a one-time injection of cash to help out, I'd really appreciate that. Because uh, we're the only people. This is, this, this is the only starship that's heading for the stars. Okay, and we're the only one that's making progress to unify. We have the unified field theory. If you look at the end of the foundation series, you'll see that the induction model is everything. Gravity, light. In other words, gravity is the DC of light. That's what the models are telling us. So those people that said, well, they observed gravity models for the first time. I'm sorry, but your Mark 1 eyeball has been seeing gravity waves since the beginning of time. Okay. Because there's no more electric field in light. There is no such thing as an electric field. Light is an inertial wave. An inertial wave is part of a gravity. So thank you very much. Thank you for all my Patreon members that have been patient. Um, I'm trying to find a way to create more time. That's one of my big goals right now. And I think the biggest thing... Well, anyway, I'm going to put more info out just to Patreon members. 
And to all my YouTube uh, subscribers, thank you for being my subscribers. We'll get there. It's a matter of time. Time will make everything occur. Thank you.